when you talk about the pharmaceutical industry, uh, if people are more likely to be poor, for example, they don't constitute as much of a market. And I'm saying that in air quotes. So the industry may decide not to invest. But then when you look at private philanthropy's investment in diseases, there are clear examples of where diseases that disproportionately affect white people versus black people, the investment skews towards the diseases that affect white people. And I want to be very careful about what I'm saying because I'm a patient advocate first and foremost. That is a good thing that those diseases get invested in. It is not okay to me that we also don't have investment in the diseases that affect Black, Indigenous, or Latinx people. Hello, dear friends and damn givers. Welcome to the Let's Give a Damn podcast. I'm your host, Nick LaPara, and this is the show where I sit down for meaningful conversations with people who aim to build fewer walls, longer bridges, and bigger tables with their lives and work. My guests want to leave the planet better than they found it, and I truly hope today's conversation gives you hope and pushes you to give more dams than ever before. So this podcast is the last one before Election Day here in the United States of America. I mean, we're releasing one on Election Day because it's a Tuesday with Gretchen Carlson, but you may not listen to it that day. Many people store their podcasts up for whenever they're ready to listen to them. So assuming that that will happen for many of you, this is the last podcast before Election Day. So I have a question and a statement for you. The question first, here it is. How are you? How are you feeling truly? If you're anything like me, you're a wee bit anxious and nervous, as there are without a doubt some wild, crazy days ahead, regardless of who wins. Please take care of yourselves these next few days and weeks. Get plenty of sleep, eat well, drink lots of water, get some exercise, and try to stay off social media as much as possible. I'm serious about all of those things. Mental health, physical health require a holistic approach, and we need our mental health and physical health to be in tip-top shape right now. So that's the question. And now for the statement. Friends, for the love of God, please go vote. I'm hearing so many stories from friends my age that have never voted before, and this is their first time voting. And there's no judgment there. I'm proud of them. This is wildly important. I don't presume to know who you, friends, are voting for, but if you plan to vote for Biden, and I'll say it this way, because there are so many nuances and everything is gray, not black and white, right? So I'll say it this way. If you plan to vote for Biden or if you plan to vote against Donald Trump by voting for Biden, please vote. Trump has already wreaked havoc on this election by talking so much about how this is going to be a rigged election if he loses. Obviously, if he wins, everything will be fair game, fair and square, he won it. But if he loses, he's going to cry rigged election. Therefore, we need the numbers to be so unmistakably higher so there's no question on election night, right? Because it will be so bad for this country if we, if we or he, rather, drags this out for days and weeks to come. So please fucking vote. There are already record, and by, by record, I mean by hundreds and hundreds of percent. There are already record number of people that have voted. Please keep that up. Go early vote if you can. There won't, the lines won't be super long. I know I live in a major city. I live in Nashville. And I waited in line for 30 minutes. That's it. Everybody can spare that. Everybody can do that. So please go fucking vote. And hit me up at 646-328-6414 or email me at hello at letsgiveadam.com. If you have any questions at all about these coming days, I'd love to chat. I'd love to help out in any way that I can. Now that we've briefly covered this important upcoming election, and friends, if you live outside the U.S., I'm so sorry you had to sit, listen to that for the last minute. We're in a little bit of a shit show right now here in the U.S. But now that we've covered that, let's introduce our amazing guest. My guest today is the wonderful Preeti Christel. Preeti has spent almost two decades leading within a movement that increases global access to affordable life-saving medicines by restoring integrity to the patent system, our wildly outdated, wildly unfair patent system. She graduated from NYU Law and then went to India to join the Lawyers Collective, an ACLU of sorts, 
where she successfully advocated for the expansion of the universal treatment program for HIV. That work ultimately led to a pivotal moment in treatment access history, the passage of a health-friendly patent law in India. Because of her work and their work, India became the first country to enact a health-friendly patent law, clearing the way for the patent oppositions that would make IMAC, which she co-founded the following year, a global force in the treatment access movement. Christelle has since taken her fight from the streets of India to over 50 countries all around the world. Preeti has been featured in TED Women, and I'll make a note here, go watch her amazing TED Talk. It's fantastic, super, super great. She's been featured in TED Women, Entrepreneur, CNN, The New York Times, Bloomberg, CNBC, Wall Street Journal, The Hill, and others. Also, she mentions coming from a family of healers. When I'm when, At the beginning, when she's talking about her family, she mentions, among other things, coming from a family of healers. That stuck with me. We didn't, we didn't riff on it too much at that point. Later on, we circle back and talk about it for a few minutes before we wrap up. So pay attention to those parts. Here's the deal. We all need to be healers and we all need to be healed. And I loved that idea for hours after our conversation. I couldn't stop thinking about it. I was at a book club later on that, that evening after our conversation and it came up again because we so desperately, more than most of the shit that we try to do online, on social media, and even in person, more than any of those things, we need to become healers and we need to heal. So pay attention to those parts. I could go on and on with who she is and what she's done, but I'd rather let her tell you in her own words. So I'm gonna shut up now and let's get right into our conversation, yeah? As always, you can reach me anytime and for any reason by texting 646-328-6414 or by emailing me, hello at letsgiveadam.com. Now, here is my conversation with damn giver extraordinaire, Preeti Christel. Let's go. I'm so thrilled to have Preeti Christel on the Let's Give a Damn podcast. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's so great to be here. Fantastic. Um, we are going to talk about some really fascinating things that have uh, some like real-time implications right now. We're going to talk about patents and medicine and our healthcare system. And it's wild right now, you know, living here in the U S um, you know, during a time, you know, right now we're living in real time through a pandemic and there's all these talks of, you know, vaccines and medications and antibody therapies and all these things. Right. And when I was introduced to your work a couple weeks ago, I, re- I watched your Ted, your Ted talk at Ted women, 2019. And I just started looking around. I thought, man, this is a conversation we need to have because, um, most of the listeners live in the United States. We have listeners in 50, 60 countries, but most of them live here and in North America in some way. And there is a there's a lot of frustration with the medical, sort of our medical system and our lack of healthcare. I mean, we talk about being this like incredible nation, the, the greatest nation on the, you know, the, the world has ever seen. And yet we have hundreds of thousands of people every year going bankrupt because of our health, our lack of healthcare system and our ridiculous, you know, medicine costs, right? And so uh, I've been fascinated with this conversation for a long, long time. Before we get into all of that, though, I want to get to know you, right? Because I didn't just invite you on to talk about medicine and patents and all that. I invited you on because I think you give a damn. And w- what I want to do is discover how and why you became the damn giver that you are. So I always start out with just like looking for some history. So when I say, give me the who, what, when, where, and why of your life. Like, how did you get here doing the things that you're doing, giving a damn about the things you're giving a damn about? Um, Let's just riff on that for a little bit. And then we'll get into the the really big shit that we're going to dive into here soon. Okay. So I always go back to my family. I come from a family of journalists and organizers and healers uh, from India and I think that spirit of investigation and figuring out why things don't work and fighting for people really comes from them. My grandfather was part of the freedom movement in India. So he was jailed before I was born. Um, and he started an underground newspaper, you know, 
on slates to make sure Indians could still fight for their independence from the British. And so I remember being really, really little and him teaching me how to be like that. You know, he made me read the dictionary uh, when I was four and he said, nobody can ever take words away from you. So no matter what else happens, you can use your voice. Wow, you know, he was like that. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And so I remember being really young and just having that spirit from the people in my family um, and questioning everything. And that was a pain for my parents, of course. But um, as I got older, it started to get channeled, I think, in more constructive ways. Uh, and after law school, I moved to India. And I always had this feeling because, you know, when you grow up not just around people from the United States, you, get, you know that the U.S. can be kind of insular, but also having the opportunity then after college to go live in other countries, work in other countries, you realize just how much we are not served by that insularity, mm. right? We don't understand anything because the whole world revolves around us. And so I got to, for example, work at the global level at the WHO um, on health. I got to work with human rights lawyers in India on the ground and through that work with activists from South Africa and Brazil and Sri Lanka and just really learn what was happening with people, how people made change. Um, and now, you know, Fast forward, it's 20 years into the work, but now I'm a mom. And so I'm thinking about that whole, my son is two still, I'm about to be three. And I'm thinking about, well, how do I bring all of that to him that was passed down to me? And how do I take all this experience and give him a way of really being American, but being the kind of American that maybe we're all aspiring to right now? My heart uh, leapt multiple times during uh, the last couple of minutes, you describing your upbringing, because I feel exactly the same way. I was born in New York, raised in Guatemala, mm -hmm. and I loved not growing up here. I maybe, maybe part of it was I didn't know what I was missing. So, you know, you, uh, so you were born here and raised here then, and then moved, moved into when you were an adult, essentially, like after, you said after exactly. law school. So a little different with me in that, like I was, a, it was all my teen years, all my teenage years, preteen and all the way through the end of high school. Mm -hmm. And I guess I just didn't know what I was missing, you know, and I didn't care. Like all my, you know, I had friends that I kept in touch with, but one thing that was, I, I realized the same exact thing when I moved, when I finally started coming back here more, and then I finally moved back here for the first six years that I was back here as a, you know here was my home, I still traveled the world. So I rarely spent any time here. I lived out of two suitcases and literally for six years, didn't own anything and just traveled full time for work and for play and for everything else. So I still didn't get the, the fullness of what you just, just described, which was America is so insulated. America thinks that America is everything, right? America thinks that America doesn't need anyone else. And so I still didn't get that until my late 20s when I got married and started to settle down and I still haven't really settled down. I still am all over the place all the time, but a little more, you know, thinking about family more and where we're going to, where we're going to be, how we're going to be as a couple. And then, you know, in the future, how we're going to raise our kids. I started to see that so much and it is, it has never stopped. It has never not bothered me how I've spent time in over 30 countries and I've never met a people. And the people on this podcast might be sick of it at this point because I do shit on America a lot. Um, <laughs> it, not, not because I don't think that America is fine or even great. It's not that at all. It's because I think that America has potential, you know, kind of like mirroring back to, you know, uh, uh, James Baldwin, where he said, I love America more than you do. I love America so much that I reserve the right to perpetually criticize her, right? It's in that <laughs> spirit that I criticize America and say, you can be and do you can be better and do more than you're doing now. Mm. But there is this like weird feeling of like, like I've never been anywhere that where people don't travel to other places as much as they don't here. I live in the mid South right now. Most of the people, if I could go walk on the streets right now and ask people, most of them have never left the United States. Some of them have left like a three state radius, right? Mm. But you go to Europe and you go to, I grew up in Guatemala, like all my Guatemalan friends, like spent time all over Europe growing up and they were all over the place. And only here do we kind of see that that insular nature where people we don't need anybody else. Uh, we're, we're good, all on our own, and that's just that 
I think breathes sort of maybe the some of the selfish nationalism that we're seeing right now, maybe where, mm -hmm. you know, I, I feel like I also have a different vantage point because I was everything you're saying is really landing with me. And I was raised in a community uh, that I think is the best of America. So when my parents got here, they lived in a few states, ended up in California by the time I was six. And my mom was very aware that we didn't have blood relatives here. And so she created a chosen family. And so the people who we consider family to this day, who we spent our holidays with, our weekends with, were white, black, um, Guatemalan actually, Honduran, nice. um, liberal, conservative, uh, but very globally minded. Like we had fierce debates at dinner and we didn't agree on things. Um, and there were people around that table who were HIV positive, who were transgendered. Like we had such, I can't even believe now looking at that, that I was blessed enough to be raised in something so unusual because I didn't know it was unusual as a kid, you know? So I had people there guiding me as elders that just, there's a lot of difference in this country and we all love each other and we can yell during board games or during political discussions. And at the end of the day, we're still family, you know? So I know that that's possible in America, but I think we have to want it. That's 100% it. It is available to us right now. We can access that. We can access that, you know, the way I describe it, um, it, the way I've, uh, it took me a little while to figure it out, but the way I'm describing it with let's give a damn is we need to aim to build fewer walls, longer bridges and bigger tables. Mm. Like that is, and that's one of the, that's one of the big like kind of spirits and elements behind the TV show we're doing is we can't, like I clearly land on the left on most, if not all issues, right? Mm -hmm. But I also see the necessity of not getting too far left because the far left and the far right, they're just the same. They're, it's the same coin, just two different sides. It can get really hateful and spiteful and a lot of fuck yous and a lot of like, we don't need you. And it's like, no, 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 that's just not, that's not how any society advances, gets better, fixes itself. It has to be this, um, it has to be this desire. Like you said, we have to want it. We have to want to respectfully dialogue and get people with differing opinions, different ideas around the table, a metaphorical or a physical table, hopefully a physical table, because everything, everything happens better over a few drinks and, uh, you know, a, a good meal. And we can, we have, we can have that here. I, I'm actually, I don't know about you. I'm, um, we're meeting for the first time, so I don't presume to know anything about your politics or your ideas or anything. I can get a little bit of it from looking at your work, but I'm quite I'm beyond alarmed and I'm quite scared about, you know, post uh, November America, because, you know, a lot of people on my side of the aisle, maybe our side of the aisle is like, oh, I mean, it's it's heaven after November three. If Biden wins, you know, it's like everything's going to get way better. And I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand. Like Trump is just a he's just a symptom. That's all he is. Like, sure, he's a piece. He, he's a shitty person in so many ways, but he's just he's just a symptom. He gave permission to tens of millions of Americans to express their their unhealthy nationalism and their white supremacist ideas. Like those people are still here after November 3 and after January when the new president is installed, if it's not Trump again for a second term, they're not going anywhere. And that's that's so alarming to me because most what the way you're describing your upbringing is very, very, very rare. I did not grow up in that. I grew up in a very conservative evangelical circle, um, very tight knit. We yeah. only hang out with our own. We, uh, yeah, I mean, you have to live up to our standards to kind of be in because we don't mess with the world. We don't hang with the unclean, the sinners, right? So mm -hmm. I grew up, man, I, I think about, I envy what you grew up in and I think I'm now giving a chance to my, my kids. We are, my wife and I are giving a chance mm -hmm. to our kids to grow up in that sort of an environment because you're living proof of what can happen if you grow up in that. Yeah, and I think we lose so much. This is exactly what you're saying too about the danger 
of being drawn too much into any ideologies. I think we lose so much when we don't have difference around us. Uh, so it's something that since my husband and I got together, we've really, I think I was looking at a map today and I think in the last five years, we've traveled to more Southern states than I probably had in my entire life. But what a difference in my worldview to sit and have dinner and break bread with people who I never would have met had I not gone to sit in Tennessee, in Kentucky, you know, spend my holidays in Georgia. Like, what does that look like to really understand rather than learning everything through social media? Which, by the way, I think is it's like one of the worst things that has ever happened to us. Oh, it's it is it is it is all but destroyed us at this point. And I hate that I partake in in you know I I I try to be responsible with my you know small little following, but I know that sometimes it might I I'm always at the edge of if I don't go overboard, I'm always at the edge of like becoming that person that I would hate to look at in the mirror, that I would hate to interact with all of a sudden I'm doing it because it's so easy, right? And what you're describing, this like going around, breaking bread with people that you never would have thought to, you know, a few years ago or a few months ago or whatever. What I've discovered as well, which is why I'm, which is why I'm banking a lot. I'm banking the future of my organization and all of the things we're doing with it, the nonprofit side and the investment firm and the, the podcast and the book and the TV show. Like I'm banking it all on the premise, this premise that we're talking about, that if we want society to get better, in this case, our society right right here, the American mm -hmm. society, it has to be, it's a joint effort. Not mm -hmm. that I'm going to ascribe to uh, most, if not all conservative beliefs, uh, just speaking for myself personally, but we have to work hand in hand uh, to, to fix this shit show, failed experiment of a country that we're living in now. Um, it can't be done by just us, by us, I mean, like, yeah, the people that I think are right, the people that I'm going to, you know, lean on, the direction I'm going to lean, we, it can't just be us because there's hundreds, literally hundreds of millions of people in this country that don't believe that. And you can't move a society forward. You can't move a country forward if most of the people think you're wrong and are not willing to come to the table. I think what happens when you have proximity too is this very subtle dissolution or dissolving of those walls that you were talking about. Like I remember on my birthday last year, I was sitting with a group uh, and one of my friends who is not from the coast, uh, who does identify as white male and conservative from another state. We had this, you know, I think it was four or five hours talking about race, all of us. And at the end of it, he said something that has it really, it stayed with me and it keeps coming up for me because he said, if we had never had this conversation, I just, based on where I live and my community, I never would have known that you as a not black person of color grapple so much and do so much work in your community on anti-black racism. I thought this was all my load to bear to figure out how we're going to solve for this and move America forward. And I was like, well, that's a lonely place to be, wow. you know, uh, and he's doing the work. He's amazing. Um, but not in the ways that we would expect, you know, on the coast. And it's, it's beautiful. And I think that's what happens when we have not just proximity, but like a willingness. Um, and not that everybody has to do that either. I'm just saying that that type of, interaction actually breeds something really beautiful and I'd love to see more of it happening. Yeah. Oh man. I, I get so excited about this type of conversation happening because yeah, I'm banking a lot on, we need to do more of this. You and me, the people that were in close proximity to our communities, like we've got to do, it's not my main work to be talking about this all the time. I do a lot of, I do a lot of different things, but mm -hmm. um, every chance we get, we have to encourage people to do that. And, and also just to, throwback to five minutes ago, get the hell off social media, not off it completely, but we, we have to, it's, it's so bad for us. It's so bad for our health, physical, mental, spiritual, emotional, all of it. It's, all of it. it's so bad <laughs> and yet it can be used for so much good. And so we're, we're kind of in a pickle, aren't we? Um, before we, um, man, there's so much that I want to talk to you about. Let's, so you talked about moving to India after law school. Mm -hmm. Take us on the journey from like, yeah, talk to talk about your time in India 
leading up to because you've been in this kind of work that we're going to we're going to kind of we're going to talk out for the rest of our conversation you've been this work for quite some time this is not a this is not a shtick for you and it's not something new this is like this is your this is your stuff this is what you know way better than i'll ever know and so how did that sort of growth and progression happen how did you get that invested and that involved in it Mm mm-hmm when I went to India, I worked at a place called the Lawyers Collective. It's, I guess the best way to describe it is it's kind of like the ACLU of India. Uh, and they've taken on the hard fight. You know, they have litigated against very powerful people um, for things that I will not actually talk about right now. I just realized uh, yeah. they have taken on the hard fights. And in this climate with, I'll just say with governments around the world moving to the right, the consequences of doing that type of human rights litigation are getting more and more severe. Uh, And so when I moved there, I got to work with these lawyers who completely changed my worldview on what it means to be a lawyer, to serve communities and to litigate. Because a lot of the ways in which they worked was to be steeped deep in community and to have community-led processes for litigation. And I don't really see that happening here. Um, We've moved towards it in the last 20 years, but at the time it was very new. And our clients were all people either living with HIV, living with cancer, living with TB, um, who were living below the poverty line, couldn't afford their medicines, were facing healthcare discrimination and Uh, who were not being asked for consent when they were being enrolled in clinical trials. Many of them were sex workers or were trans or were LGBTQ, um, other parts of the LGBTQ. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so were just criminalized for just being themselves. And so these lawyers were um, working at every level in legal structures and in a society at the time that didn't have protections in place because the pandemic was relatively new at the time, the HIV pandemic. Uh, And that experience, I think, really informed my understanding of a few things. One is just how to be a lawyer and be in service. But maybe more importantly, for this moment we're in, what happens during a global pandemic when drugs are developed but aren't reaching the majority of the world who needs them? What are the systems and the power structures in place that are enabling that injustice and inequity? And then what are the things you need to do to fight to correct for that and how long is it gonna take? Um, And so my life since that time has been walking pretty much the same path for HIV, for hepatitis C, and going way beyond India. We've worked across the emerging markets, uh, Brazil, Argentina, Thailand, Ukraine, and a number of other countries, China. uh, And now really we've come home in the last five years to the US to say, none of this is gonna change unless we go to the power source and that's here. That's massive. I mean, um, the, the fight that you have chosen to engage in, right? Mm-hmm. is it feels not it feels like it pro- it feels very david and goliath you mm-hmm. know um now in this now going back to the story of david and goliath david wins right in the end and goliath goes down this big monster of a you know monster of a warrior but before knowing that goliath goes down everything looked like it was against david you know no one was betting on david because how could David, this small boy, uh, beat this huge, huge, indescribably huge, powerful giant? Um, and so before we even get into it, like I applaud you, your team, everybody that works with you on this, um, on the incredible work, because it's so significant, it's so important, and um, I'm rooting for you. I really am. And we'll, we'll get into all of it, but I'm just like, again, I was introduced to your work not even a couple of weeks ago and I've just been blown away by, you know, how, how impressed I am by you, how excited I am for you. And also just like the immensity of it, because it, I mean, you're not alone. Lots of people have fought against what you're fighting against and have mm-hmm. lost. 
Um, and if you look at the course of history, these powerful entities, these powerful individuals, these powerful people, most of the time throughout history has been white men. Um, they usually win. They usually win. <laughs> they have historically won because they are so big and powerful. But this one needs to change. Like this is the time in history for this shit to get blown up because we have to bring not just equality, but equity to this space that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. You and I are probably on the same wavelength that healthcare is a right. I have, I, I have been fighting so much over the last three years. I mean, very level-headed conservative friends of mine that have fought back on that. And I'm like, okay, we can, we can fight about other things. We can fight about a universal basic income. We can fight about housing as a right. Like I believe all those, like I believe all those things are, are a right, right? Mm -hmm. I think you being a society providing for you to be a whole being, I believe that's a right, but that's a different conversation for a different day. The one I won't budge on is fucking healthcare. Mm -hmm. If you don't have your health, you have nothing. That's right. And uh, so there's so, so much at play here. So let's, let's get into it. Uh, how did IMAC come to be? How did, how did, how did you and those involved in it start that? And, and what does it entail? So the, during those years with the Lawyers Collective, we were working on exactly this. We were working on health as a human right uh, across the board. And I started getting more and more interested in this medicines piece, because what I was seeing with our clients is that Medicines literally determined who lived and who died, particularly for communities at the time we called vulnerable communities or marginalized communities uh, all around the world. And so when it came to medicines, uh, this is when I met some of the people who I still run IMAC with today, uh, Tahir Amin, who was a private sector IP lawyer from the UK, Joe Fortunac, who is a former industry player. He was uh, in the leadership of some of big pharma companies on the scientific side. And we met and we realized that when it came to HIV scale up in particular, uh, what was standing in the way of getting more affordable uh, versions of these medicines to most of the low and middle income countries in the world was the IP right. Uh, not the legitimate ones when the original drugs were invented, but right, the system right. was being gamed. The monopolies were getting longer and longer uh, and competition couldn't enter the market. And so because both of them had such significant experience working in the pharmaceutical industry and on the IP side in the private sector, they basically visioned uh, that we needed to use pharmaceutical industry tactics against the industry. So there is a mechanism called patent challenges, where you go to court or you go to the patent office and you challenge patents and you say that this isn't actually a scientific invention. Uh, so we started filing those and we started winning. So we started filing more challenges. We started winning. And over the last, whatever it's been, 15 years, we've unlocked something like $50 billion in cost savings for health wow. systems around the world who have been able to put millions of people on treatment. So it's been an amazing journey. We definitely felt like David and Goliath for most of it. Um, and I think we've just reached the point now, though, that it's not good enough because we're still litigating on single drugs in single countries. Uh, and honestly, like, that's not the way we need the mm. system to change. It's like what you were saying at the beginning, like the foundation of things now needs to change. And so we're making a big pivot where we are starting to step more and more into our role as educators to expose the structural inequality. First of all, I feel like most people don't even understand that we have a medicine system that's separate from healthcare, right? That, 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 that's what I was, I was, I was about to interrupt you and we're, uh, hopefully this is a, <laughs> a, a case of great minds think alike. Most people listening have no fucking idea what you're talking about, right? They, they, they just, they just know that they go to the store, they go to Target, the CVS mm -hmm. pharmacy, they pick out a medicine, they know they're paying way too much. They don't know why or how or when or where and they mm -hmm. buy it. They take it home or their insurance. You know, like I went to, I went to, uh, I have, my doctor told me when I was younger that my asthma would go away when I was like 10 or 12. And here I am at 37 with terrible asthma still. And so I went to pick up my, you know, the other day I went to pick up an inhaler and, mm -hmm. um, you know, my insurance 
covered all but th- it was like three dollars it was a super tiny copay so i so i pay the three dollars get my latest inhaler look at the box and it says god i don't want to i don't want to exaggerate but it was somewhere between 400 it was like four hundred dollars mm-hmm. four hundred dollars for something that could save my life um Four hundred dollars for mm-hmm. one inhaler that has one hundred and twenty puffs in it. So what is that? Four dollars a puff. I have. To, I take. You know. I take. Uh, it's you take it every morning and night. It regulates. It's not the emergency inhaler. It's the one you take every day mm-hmm. uh, to kind of regulate things. So that's two in the morning, two at night. That's like sixteen dollars a day or some shit like that. Like that's mm-hmm. insane. So most people, that's that's the extent of their knowledge, right? Or they've or they've seen news clips of Martin Screlly, right? Um, mm-hmm. And like all the crazy stuff he did, but they don't know how we got here Mm -hmm. and what this, and that the medis, the medic, the medicine industry is different and separate and complements in, in many ways, the healthcare industry. So give us that history. Like talk to me, talk to us like we're Mm -hmm. six for a little bit and sort of (laughs) kind of, so, because I think once you describe all of that, people are going to feel the enormity. Uh, If they haven't already, they're going to feel the enormity of your work and they're going to be hopefully a little more pissed off than they are right now because it's craziness. So start with that. Yeah. And I would say that I don't think it's anything that people don't know. It's just not top of mind. You know, it's not in the media every day to think about it like a a system. But when you think about the fact that there are people making decisions based on the markets of what drugs we need to invest in for R and D, And then drugs go through that whole research process. Funding decisions are made. Other sorts of scientific decisions are made at that point. Uh, Then those inventions, whether it's devices or treatments or vaccines, they get patented. Then they go through clinical trials. Then we have to figure out which suppliers can produce them. Where do they get their parts? You know, like right now there's a lot of discussions about vials for covid Uh, So where do they get all the pieces that they need? Um, How do we get competition? Where is competition being blocked? And then ultimately, how do people get diagnosed? How do they get their prescriptions? And then who gets the drugs or vaccines and who doesn't? That's the whole system. But when you look at that system and it's, you know, holistic and it's totality, uh, what you see is that there is structural inequality, inequity, injustice baked into it. Um, Whether you're talking about the global south and how right now we're in this moment where with COVID, the high income countries have bought up the world supply probably for the next few years. So if you are from a lower or middle income country, you're not getting your vaccine till after 2024. Um, And the ways in which we're choosing as America, for example, to opt out of global health infrastructure that would allow that to be more equitable, that's an example of the way in which in our medicine system, that kind of inequity is baked in because it's about power and it's about the market and it's about money. So who gets to make the decisions? And the reason this is really bad, like right now this research has come out that says that if we were to collaborate and make sure that every country got some vaccine proportional to its population, we would be able to cut the number of deaths worldwide in half. We could save twice as many lives if we were to be collaborative. But the U.S. has taken the position that we're not going to collaborate. We're making side deals and we're buying up the world supply. And once our people are taken care of, then we'll figure out what to do about everybody else. And this is not just a deep moral failing. This is a public health problem because we are not going to curb this pandemic. We're not going to curb it in a timely way if we keep going down this path. In your fascinating TED talk at TED Women last year, um, you mentioned a few, it was a great talk, by the way. It was super great. I loved loved that story at the beginning when you talked about Rudy, your partner, uh, falling in love with your with your dad, right? Over (laughs) over the this um sorry, one second, something popped up on my screen. Um over this medicine that he had worked on that retroactively could have saved his father 15 years ago right so there was that like they they connected on something very very deep right but you talked about how there are two billion people on the planet right now 
which is a huge number. That's uh, over a quarter of the people on the planet right now live without access to medicine. Mm -hmm. And correct me if I'm wrong, on this one, you said 34 million Americans have lost, lost a friend or a family member in the last five years, not because treatment didn't exist, but because they couldn't afford it. And we live in this country, you know, what you just described of, before I started speaking makes me really, 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 really uh, upset. And I have to figure out once again, you know, what to do with that uh, anger, because that's really fucked up the way that you just described how America is relating to the rest of the world when it comes mm -hmm. to medicine, when it comes to vaccines. It feels very selfish. It feels very un-American. And mm -hmm. also it feels very, hey, we can fix this, but we're just choosing not to, mm -hmm. right? Like we are, right. we are incredibly wealthy. We are, uh, we have so many resources. We have incredible minds working on incredible things. Mm -hmm. uh, we have people right now, tr you know, trying to get to, trying to get to other planets in our solar system mm -hmm. when we haven't even begun to figure out how to live here, right? And um, so talk about, let, let's, let's dive into this uh, 34 million Americans lost a friend or f f f loved one in the last five years, not because okay. treatment didn't exist, but because they couldn't afford it. Like, what does it look like right now in the US in terms of, you know, bankruptcies uh, as it relates to, healthcare, right? Medical bills, people okay. that not, not because there was a tornado in their health, their, their business got destroyed, not because of any other thing, the, a very preventable thing like healthcare bills, healthcare costs, medical costs. We, ha it only exists here of all the developed nations in the world. We're the only ones that have this. It doesn't exist in these other countries. Um, so let's talk about that for a second. How do we, what's going on there? Why is that happening? And how do we fix it? How do we fix this? So right now, I would say that we have heard stories from all over the country uh, that people are, of course, filing for bankruptcy. We've heard from people who are living in their cars, who have sold all their assets, you know, from their homes to their wedding rings. Students have dropped out of school, all because they couldn't afford their prescription drugs. And those numbers are particularly uh, poignant when you're talking about people of color. So that 34 million uh, figure that you said that, you know, of the number of Americans who said they've lost a family member or a friend in the last five years, that's, you're twice as likely to have gone yes. through that if you're a person of color. And so, and those types of, findings are coming out more and more post pandemic. Like I gave that talk right before the pandemic hit the new data we're seeing about what's happening, not just here, but globally, the number of people being pushed into poverty, uh, the number of people who are suffering without being able to get access to medicines and then what's happening as a result, how their health is getting worse and what the consequences of that are. Um, it's very, very stark, uh, if I were to go to the root cause, it's the way we've structured our market. It's the way we've structured our economy. And nowhere is that more clear than we when we start to look at how COVID medicines and vaccines are being developed. There are no special rules for how the market functions during a pandemic. And so we're seeing the government subsidize the development of these vaccines, for example, heavily because the market doesn't work for vaccines. I don't know sure. if that's well understood, but it's too risky for industry to start doing research and development on vaccines when you don't know if a pandemic's going to hit, whether it's going to stay, how many people are going to get infected. And so the government steps in to basically be the angel investor uh, for that field. And what's been really alarming, and there's been a lot of amazing activism around this, is there haven't been any conditionalities placed on that funding that we know of. So you're writing billion dollar checks to drug companies who have never brought a vaccine to market. You're asking them to enter a space they've never entered before. And then you're relying on their benevolence to make sure that all Americans are getting that vaccine at a fair cost. And you're not actually saying anything about the rest of the world. It's deeply problematic. I remember 
growing up in Guatemala, and I don't know how it is in India. I've been to India twice, uh, spent, spent quite a bit of time in Hyderabad and mm-hmm. loved, loved it there. But growing up in Guatemala, we could go to the pharmacy for anything. Mm-hmm. You don't need a prescription. You just go and you pay the money mm-hmm. and it's really affordable. I mean, literally you could get Novocaine over the counter, like you get whatever you needed over mm-hmm. the counter. Um, and I mean, healthcare, I, I actually just described this to somebody the other day. I said, we didn't have health insurance there. You know, the few times we needed to go to the hospital. So it's different. It wasn't like there was a universal health care there that everybody got. It was, you know, Guatemala's a third world country. But what, the, what that also meant was if you needed to go to the hospital, you could probably pay for it out of pocket, even if it's like a, uh, like a procedure or like a, a, like, a, like a big surgery or something. Like, it's, it's pretty affordable. But we had, we had, um, we paid for a service every month. It's so weird thinking, thinking about this now, like our health insurance. So I have 11 siblings. We're a big family. And this was 12 people, like what are, you know, 14 with my parents. Like, how do you keep all those people safe? There's eight boys. We're playing like football every day, soccer, (laughs) and like, we're getting hurt and doing all sorts of crazy shit. And we, we, uh, subscribe, we subscribe to a service and essentially it was, it was like a private healthcare, like ambulance, like it was a fleet of ambulances with medical professionals that we paid a fee every month. I think if I'm, if I'm thinking about it now, it was, um, I'm trying to do the conversion. Uh, I mean, the, from the last time I was there, it's probably different now, but it was like, it was like, it was like a hundred bucks a month, maybe, maybe 200. And anytime we needed them, like anytime we call this number again, it's not 911. It's not a hospital we would this i mean there were times when i split my head open or we had like you know bones that needed to be set or whatever and they would come in their ambulance they come into your house and they would like set up a like a tree like set up a corner right where they were mm-hmm. going to do their their sewing of your head or whatever it was and it was just so easy and it was so affordable and it was so cheap and I have friends in Canada. Like it's not that's not just a third world country thing. That's in a lot of places where it's just easier to get shit done. It's easier to get the help that you need. I know you've already talked about it a little bit, but go into more detail if you can, or maybe just reiterate it differently. If I'm not like, I just want you to like really spell out why how do we get to the place we're in right now mm-hmm. where we're not doing we're not, we're not making it simple. It just wasn't complicated. We paid a hundred dollars a month to this service. Okay. They came when we needed help as many times as we needed them. And it was so easy. We never worried about somebody getting hurt because we knew it'd be taken care of. Even living in a third world country right after a war was done. Like it just felt so easy there. How in the hell is it easier to get medical care in a place like Guatemala in the late nineties than it is in the United States in 2020, like how do we get here and why don't we change? I guess that's probably, I mean, it's money, but like, why can't we change? Like, what do we need to do? Because I think this is the generation to not just push for, but demand those changes. It might take a few years, right? It's important people. It's, it's, it's people like you doing important work and uh, it's people taking to the streets and it's people, it's obviously voting and all that stuff, right? It's this whole big thing. How do we get here though? How did the greatest nation on earth, and I'm doing air quotes, everybody, because you all know how I feel about this place. Um, how did we get here? I'll answer you in a little bit of a roundabout way, which Please. is just that for the last 20 years while I've been doing my work, when I describe our litigation and what we're doing and why we're doing it, I would always say, look, we're not trying to overhaul the whole system. We're just trying to level the playing field, correct for the friction. Uh, And I think it's because in retrospect, we're going through a lot of reflection right now. I think it's because uh, as social justice advocates um, and people who want to make change, you also want to be effective. And if you walk into a room and say everything's about money and capitalism isn't working, there's a lot of people you're just going to who are going to turn off to what you're saying and you're not going to be able to make the change. But if you're asking me how we got here, it is how we structured our markets. Like we keep looking for new ways to meet, make money. And so if you read the history of healthcare in America, the rise of the insurance industry, how the pharmaceutical industry 
really moved from opioids to vaccines over the last century um, and the global markets, you know, this system that you're describing that we have here that we didn't have in India or Guatemala or even in the UK, there's been a big push for privatization of healthcare in those countries. Like health insurance is being brought in as a sign of prosperity, but we're exporting broken systems, right? So it's why we're moving the emerging market countries to try to adopt models that don't work for them. And they are trying to push back. We're seeing it even in health outcomes, like why in India and Brazil and so many of the emerging markets, are we seeing the rise of the wealthier classes? Why are we seeing the rise of non-communicable diseases? Why are we seeing increased diabetes, for example? Um, and it's because all of these things are interrelated. So I talk about this a lot with drug patents. For me, drug patents are a root cause of why prescription drug prices are out of control in this country. Uh, when you give somebody ownership rights and you tell them they have 20 years on the market to do whatever they want, but then we're going to have competition. And then you let your system just go lax and keep it giving them more and more and more years of protection. Where if you're a drug company, you now have 40 years of protection instead of 20 that means you get to block everybody else out from coming onto the market. Drugs don't get cheaper because you don't have competition. And then you have Congress every quarter talking about how we need to take action on prescription drug prices. But the president has come out, for example, with an executive order that doesn't get to the root of the problem. Congress keeps introducing bills that don't get to the root of the problem. You have to be willing to say, our system has gone haywire for patents. And we have to rein it back in. But not only are we not doing that, we're exporting our broken patent system that over rewards companies at the expense of working people. And we're exporting that all over the world through our trade agreements and putting a ton of pressure on other countries to adopt this model. So that's where I think it comes from. What are some, what are some, stand, some tangible steps that we need to take then to, well, I mean, I, I, I'm not even sure I need to ask you this. Uh, let's discuss it. But I, I, I know what it is. We need to, th there's a big conversation happening right now. There's a big fight happening right now between those that believe that capitalism is the way and those that believe that a more socialist, democratic socialist uh, society is the way. Mm -hmm. And um, one thing that I do know, right, like we need to all agree that America, the United States of America, has always favored white landowning males. It's always favored rich people. It's mm -hmm. always favored the wealthy. Mm -hmm. um, it's why our president, uh, he, I mean, he has fooled, he has fooled to the max hundreds of millions of Americans because he has somehow, somehow this guy who has a, who grew up with an actual gold toilets, like gold plated toilet seat, right? Like the, the guy's apartment, somehow the guy's apartment is covered in gold, everything. Somehow that guy convinced everyday working Americans that he was for them. And beyond that, he would hang out with them if, if given the opportunity. And none of that is true. So you have this guy, right? That it's, he's really good at, you know, fooling people. He, he has this mindset that I think is, is the problematic mindset, right? He, when he describes, hey, our economy is good, right? We're coming back. The economy is getting better. Mm -hmm. What does he do? He points to Wall Street, mm -hmm. right? That's what he does every single time. Every mm -hmm. time he wants to get across that I'm doing this great job, you know, getting us back from this coronavirus, he points to Wall Street. Wall Street's not America. Wall Street is not your average person. Most people don't have any interest, nor do they have any actual stock in Wall Street, right? They're not trading on their iPhones in Robinhood or whatever. They just don't care. They have no, they're not in that world. And so what do we, how do we get out of this? How do we get out of this? How do we stop thinking that way? Maybe it is the older generation dying off. Maybe it is <laughs> sort of younger leaders um, agree with them or not, but the Ilhan Omars, the AOCs, the younger kind of like fresh blood that doesn't think with that we're going to favor 
you know, these, these families and these dynasties essentially mm -hmm. that, that, that have continually been in, you know, in control in, you know, in, in rule, uh, sort of a ruling class. Um, but in, in this particular conversation, mm -hmm. what are some tangible steps that we can take as sort of, you know, those listening, you're doing obviously work at a, at a level that most people listening in this space, you're doing work that most people won't, won't be, you know, touching, right? You're, mm -hmm. you're, you're talking with the players, the big dogs, like you're in the room where it happens as it were. Mm -hmm. For everyday people, how do we help get us out of this shit that the country has uh, walked into for the last several hundred years? Cause it can't keep going. It can't keep going like this. Mm -hmm. I speak to a lot of young people. So what you were saying earlier is really how I would begin to answer this question. I think young people in America today have a very keen sense that we need systemic change. Like they understand just coming out of school that our economy is not working for the vast majority of Americans. And that anything short of rewriting the rules completely is just not going to work. Uh, and in a sense, I find that to be, you know, much like their views on gender and how it's a construct or how they are perceiving um, racial justice. I find it extremely courageous. It's certainly not how my generation of activists came into this work. And I think we are learning from them how to be in this moment. Uh, and really point to the North Star, which is that we need to restructure, like you're saying, our understanding of how Wall Street interacts with the rest of us and where we need to call for change. COVID and medicines is a very good example of that. If we believe in capitalism and that capitalism can be fixed, there are people in our society who believe that, then we believe in a free market then. And if so, uh, if government is going to subsidize all of the COVID vaccine development, then why are the companies making money twice off of that investment? They get the billion dollars up front to do the R&D. And the whole justification for skyrocketing drug costs in America is that the R&D is so expensive. But in the case of Moderna, you might have read about Moderna in the yep. press. Moderna is the front runner. Moderna is 100% subsidized by the federal government. 100%. So why do they get to make money twice off of taxpayer investment? They, These they, are should, the they, should, be, they should be giving that shit away, right? Yeah, like if, exactly. if they've been subsidized up front with a, with a tremendous amount of money, right? Like I, I'm sure that billion dollars or whatever it was, mm -hmm. that has to pay for it, right? That's a lot of money. A billion dollars is a lot of money. And you're so right. Yeah, we're getting, they're getting double the money. We're still paying for it. We're paying for it twice and they're mm -hmm. getting paid twice. They're getting paid twice and they're going to make money again because they're going to take all that research they did on the technologies behind the vaccines and they're going to come up with other products. And there's no royalties back to the federal government back to be invested in our society. So I think that this is the kind of thing where every American has a voice to talk to their member of Congress to be like, what are you doing? Like, you're not here to serve corporations. You're here to serve us. I don't want to, a few minutes ago, you talked about, uh, we began to talk about how this, this topic that we're talking about disproportionately mm -hmm. affects people of color. Mm -hmm. And so let's go back to that for a minute, because I don't want to, uh, you know, progress in our conversation without really touching on that. Mm -hmm. Like most things, wh whether we're talking medicine and healthcare right now, uh, or any number of things you know, black indigenous people of color, uh, they are disproportionately affected by this, but I want to know how, so how does a, uh, lack of representation. So let's go, let's go as they're developing these medicines, right? There's clinical trials, drug development, the whole, that whole, that whole process, right? Um, how does that, how does the lack of representation in that process mm -hmm. create gaps in our healthcare system for, uh, those people, because again, by and large, they keep getting the raw end of the deal. You know, they have for hundreds of years and they continue to, but how does that happen? Why is it important for us to understand how in this particular case, it's more of the same when it comes to, you know, black indigenous people of color? 
So I think that there's an awakening in America right now where people are understanding what racialized capitalism actually means, right? Like the ways in which the market is built for some people and excludes others. So it's no different for medicines. There are drugs that we need to see invested in to be developed for black and brown people that still have not been developed. Uh, and why is that? When you talk about the pharmaceutical industry, uh, if people are more likely to be poor, for example, they don't constitute as much of a market. And I'm saying that in air quotes. So the industry may decide not to invest. But then when you look at private philanthropy's investment in diseases, there are clear examples of where diseases that disproportionately affect white people versus black people, the investment skews towards the diseases that affect white people. And I want to be very careful about what I'm saying because I'm a patient advocate first and foremost. That is a good thing that those diseases get invested in. Yes. It is not okay to me that we also don't have investment in the diseases that affect black, indigenous, or Latinx people. And so when you continue through that medicine system, it's not just philanthropy, it's not just pharma, the NIH, which is the government body that gives money for research, it doesn't give money for um, racial disparities or racism as a key factor in health outcomes. So that's one problem. It also heavily skews towards giving funding towards white PIs or researchers as opposed to uh, black PIs or researchers. So when you look across this whole system, the same thing is true for patents and clinical trials. There's gross underrepresentation of black people and people of color. Um, also, when it comes to who owns the pharma companies, who's at the head, you know, out of all the Fortune 500 companies, for example, I think only three are headed uh, by black people. And one is pharma, which is the CEO of Merck, Ken Frazier. And so when you just look across the whole system, there is such a lack of representation, first and foremost, that there's no wonder that we're not getting culturally competent or responsive innovation. We're not getting the drugs or the things, the diagnostics that we need for these communities. But then there's also just the affordability question. Drug pricing has been top of mind for American policymakers for the last several years because the price of prescription, or sorry, prescription drug spending has tripled in the last decade. Uh, and it's supposed to double again. But we're not hearing about the distinct ways in which that affects black and brown people or women uh, or seniors. We're not really unpacking who's getting hurt in this market-driven system for medicines. And that's where we're trying to change the conversation. Yeah, that's really beautiful. Um, you know, James Baldwin has this great little line, and he was obviously referring to race, race relations and things of racism here in, in the States, obviously. But he said, uh, America is always changing, but America never changes. We live in this interesting society where if you go, I mean, just, just, I don't know, I don't know all of the presidents and the presidential races like really well, but I've studied enough to know if you look at all of the rhetoric and all the everything, you know, if you look at all the, 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 the slogans and the this and the that, is all this talk of, you know, change and progress and this and that, year after year after year, term after term after term. And yet, you know, if we're looking at uh, race, for example, you know, how in the hell are we still holding the same signs and protests now that black women were in 1960s in Selma, Alabama? Same exact signs, same exact words we're still experiencing the same things. And mm -hmm. so I feel very deeply this, you know, America is always changing. There's always movement. There's always slogans. There's always movements. There's always, there are always things happening, but no real progress is, seems to be happening. I know it's happening slowly, but surely, but if there is change happening, I don't believe it's happening at the, so you and I, we, we talked about this at the beginning, you know, this idea of, you know, building communities and sort of systems in our clo in close proximity where mm -hmm. we can teach each other and push each other and urge each other toward good things and all that. Like that can happen at a community level. And so these, these progress is happening slowly but surely, but it doesn't seem like it's happening at a, 
as a systemic level, at a foundational level. That's the difference is that it is happening. Change is happening. But it's all the 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 you's and the me's going out there and doing it in our in our in the ways that we can in our small mm -hmm. little you know little worlds, which makes me. I try to remain hopeful. I try to hold hope and, um, not not anger. I don't want to be perpetually angry, but maybe it is a little anger. I try to hold hope and anger in tension because I, I want to be both of those things all at the same time because there are things to be hopeful about and things to be angry about. But I just don't see, and so maybe this makes me too much of a pessimist here, but it's, mm -hmm. you know, we're talking about these big systemic changes that need to happen. And I just don't see them happening. I don't see them happening in our, in my lifetime anyway, um, because because again, you can look back 60 years ago and the same things that were happening then are happening now. So let me ask it this way. As we begin to, um, thank you so much for all the time that you've given us. Let's spend a few more minutes. Let's spend a few more minutes. We talk about some really heavy shit <laughs> and this is important work. It's amazing work, but it's also heavy because it, again, it, to me anyway, it doesn't seem like we're making any real progress. And part of the reason is one of, it's actually one of my very close but very conservative friends that that said this to me, which it it changed so much of my outlook. He said, "I think America's too big. We're just too big. Like yeah. if you look at the really really big countries in the world, a lot of them turned into yeah. very dictatorial, totalitarian. You know, they needed they needed an." A, a a a dominant asshole leader to kind of lead them because they got so big and uncontrollable. So they needed, they kind of like went toward this more like rigid, you know, it seems that way anyway. I'm not a historian. And then you see these smaller countries, right? If you go look at just Google, happiest countries on the planet, mm -hmm. right? Uh, most equitable countries on the planet. Countries where there is healthcare for everyone. Countries where, like, best countries to raise your family. You look at all of those, none of those are America. Like, we're not on, the United States of America is not on any of those lists. Mm -hmm. and you look at them, and they're smaller. They're more manageable, right? Mm -hmm. And I will say, many of many of them are led by women, which we need way more of, right? Um, mm -hmm. Bless you, Angela Merkel in uh, Germany. But... You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know if that's totally true. Again, I'm not an historian, but I, I, I just wonder if America is too, I wonder because my friend, you know, helped me see that, like, maybe America is just too big. And that's why these changes, A, might never happen, or B, are going to take a really long time to happen mm -hmm. because it's 350 million people and growing. Like, it's not, I mean, it's not slowing down. More people are moving here, you know, um, so Here's where I'm getting at. I'm just rambling at this point, but I'm getting to this. We've talked about some heavy stuff. Where and how do you feel hopeful? What are we getting better at? What are you hopeful for in your work? Because you you mentioned at the beginning, you've got a, or maybe you didn't in the conversation, maybe it was before we hit record, but you've got a two, almost three-year-old, right? Mm -hmm. Like I've got a five, a seven, and an eight-year-old, almost a six, seven, eight-year-old, right? We got these children that we that we want to, you know, uh, in the in the the TV show pilot that we just shot this past weekend. The subject of most of what we did was this amazing dude named Josh Mundy, and we talked about his seven-year-old son Zion, and how the whole thing there was this huge th like um, uh, thread of legacy, right? And. So you and I, we want to leave, we want to leave the planet better than we found it, not just for our kids, but especially for them. We want to leave it better than we found it for everybody, all the, all the people that we get to work with and those that we'll never meet that are affected by our work. What are you hopeful for right now? I think right now what we're seeing in America is an emergence of realization that people and communities need healing. I think people are hungry for it. We saw it after Minneapolis. Uh, I have a friend actually who works in Minneapolis where they founded a, a network 
of healers of color who are doing healing work um, and they are thinking about big things, you know, do we need a truth and reconciliation commission in the United States? What does transformative justice look like? Uh, and I think there's more and more people who are feeling called and are stepping into a role to bring spiritual justice activism uh, to the country. And I feel very energized by that. I do think it's what's needed uh, because I'm not interested to be really honest with you and who becomes president in a couple of weeks. I'm interested in the fact that, um, you know, 20 years from now, my son can come visit yours in Tennessee and I know that he will have safety. Mm. That's the question I'm interested in. And it doesn't matter who's in office to determine whether my son is safe. Uh, so I'm very inspired by the work that's happening by so many of these healers. Uh, and I hope that it continues. I love that. Uh, we don't talk enough about healing on this show. I, I am a Enneagram 8. Ooh. I am, I am a, 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 a challenger. I'm a, my wife's, you said four, my wife's a four. Mm. Um, I, I, uh, I'll use this, I'll use this, this word. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. I mean, you're familiar with it, but I come from a Christian background. I'm still Christian of a different version than growing up, but you know, I, I'm more like a prophet. I always think I, I, I come in and, you know, prophets have, uh, a more finely, attuned, finely tuned, you know, moral compass and spiritual mm -hmm. compass, right? They're always like calling out what a lot of people don't see and they're mm -hmm. willing, they're willing to stick their necks out and prophets destroy more than they build up. They destroy structures that need to be brought to the ground mm -hmm. and then other people come in and heal. So I don't naturally think of healing a lot. And you mentioned at the beginning, and I'm glad you brought it up again. We're definitely on the same wavelength in this conversation because I was going to bring it up again because I don't, I don't, you know, I'm the guy who tells people to go to therapy, but doesn't go to therapy himself. And mm -hmm. I say that as an indictment on my, like, that's not good. That is not good people for me to, and a lot of it's because I'm like, oh, I've never, I, I don't struggle with anxiety. I don't struggle with depression. I'm good. Like I have this really strong mindset and it's very disciplined and yada, yada, yada bullshit. But I, yeah, I'm that guy that's like, everybody go get therapy, like go to a counselor, get help. And I, and then I don't do it. Mm. And so I'm very intrigued by this idea of heal, this healing. And you're so right that there are the people that I respect and love the most the people that I'm drawn toward again, because you got this like opposites attract thing, right? I'm not really drawn toward people like me because I think we're a lot, we're a lot to handle and I don't need any more of me around me, but I am really attracted to people that, and I love this word healing, uh, the Brian Stevensons of the world, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, these people that don't give in to, you know, you almost sometimes think, how are you not more upset about what's going on? How are you not more angry? I mean, look at all the shit that Brian went through in his life. And, but look at all the fruit now, decades later. And um, so I'm very interested. I, I, I love that you went there. And I need to do a better job myself of pursuing healing, mm -hmm. partaking in healing, and also probably being healed myself, you know, because I know that I have a long ways to go to become a person that uh, acts, lives, and thinks prophetically, but in a way that doesn't hurt people mm. more, more than I need to, right? Like I'm okay pushing buttons. I'm okay pushing back on ideas and people and things. And, and again, I don't, it's been years since I cared about what anybody thought about me. Like, it's impossible to offend me. Like I just, it's, it's impossible, but that, that actually could make me very dangerous. Right. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm separated from my feelings. I still can get my feelings hurt, I guess, but like, you can't, yeah, like I've, I've, I've so strongly put my opinions and my ideas forth and I've worked really hard to be a, uh, I've worked really hard to fix things that I see wrong in the world but I haven't done good enough work at this point to be a really successful bridge builder. I've talked about, you know, I mentioned at the beginning, fewer walls, longer bridges, bigger tables. Like that is not only kind of the emerging spirit and hope of let's give a damn, but it's mm -hmm. also very aspirational for me. Cause I'm like, I'm not there. I'm not there yet. 
I am I have a lot of burnt bridges that I need to figure out how to go repair or at least just like count my losses and try to not do it the next time, right? Mm -hmm. So I feel I'm very grateful for you and your work because you're approaching again, this is a kind of a best you're kind of a best case scenario because you're approaching this like this Goliath of an issue, something that will probably take your whole entire life to make yeah. progress in, right? But you're doing it in a way where the beginning and end of our conversation, when I said, what are you hopeful about? And you say, the healing that's happening, the healing that's beginning to happen. Like that's the best case scenario, not you're so angry about everything that's happening, right? Because it, 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 we can, people like me can get some work done. We can get some stuff done. But I think ultimately um, it's going to take more and more people that are interested in, yeah, extending the olive branch and saying, I disagree with you. I don't think you're right on this, but let's try to work together. Mm -hmm. Instead of you're wrong, fuck you, um, we're going to do it all on our own. Mm-hmm. Because that, if 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 it's true, what I said before, that we are 335 million people and we're just too big of a country, all the more reason to be that person, right? Because we're not coming from a place of, we're not even remotely coming from a place of unification where people, you know, like the, the people that are, the people that are, it's not like there's 70% of us or 80% of us that agree on a certain way of living and 20% right. don't. No, no, no. It's like it seems most days like it's 50 50. Like it seems like we are, I'm at odds in some way, ideologically, sociologically, culturally with every other person that I meet. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, you know, more incumbent upon us to, um, to live as healers, mm -hmm. to pursue, to pursue healing. Um, what's the future look like for, let's wrap up with this. You've given, you've been so gracious with your time, your work. You talked about, I asked you what you're hopeful for. Your work specifically, like what are what's what's coming down the pipeline? Like, give some like practical things. What are you all working on right now? So I personally am spending the coming years doing a lot more educating and activating. Yes. I really want to see us building a new generation of movement leadership, uh, particularly Black and Brown leaders who are interested in bringing. Uh, more equity into the medicine system. So I'm really excited about that work. Uh, like I mentioned, I get to spend a lot more time with young people. So it's been incredible. Uh, and organizationally, we are launching something called participatory change making, where we're looking at the system now, but we're bringing people together. I guess this is what we've been talking about the whole time, bringing people together across uh, ideological geographic or sectoral difference who all see this system from different lenses and bringing them into relationship and conversation so that they can start to really understand the different ways in which the system for medicines and the patent system in particular uh, is impacting people's lives and their health. And then hopefully from that place, we can start to look at the relationships that we've built and the insights that we've gained to start to say what reform should look like. That's wonderful work. That's exciting. That gets me really excited. Where can people find out more about you, um, your company, the work that you all are doing? Mm -hmm. uh, I am at, at Preeti Krishtel on Twitter. And my organization is at IMAC Global, I-M-A-K Global. So that is probably the best place. And they should most definitely Google your name and TED Talk. Because that's a that's a great twelve minute overview, <laughs> way more succinct than we just did it. Because I ramble um, on the work that you're doing, because it's it's really exciting. And again, that was just a great great talk. I gave a uh, a TEDx talk uh, a couple years ago in Chicago, and um, your talk was way better than mine. <laughs> I will check it out though. <laughs> it was fun. It was about my minimalism and living out of two bags for several years, and um, I was just really impressed with uh, your talk and I'll continue to share it. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm, uh, I know we just met, but like I'm really proud of your work and I'm grateful to know that you're doing it and you, I'm a fan. I'm a fan and I will continue to follow what you're doing 
and I hope we can keep in touch and I'll continue to tell people about who you are and what you're doing. So thank you. Thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you so much for having me. Well, my friends, that's the show for today. A massive thanks to Preeti Krishtel for joining us. So much to learn from her incredible work and her incredible life. Visit letsgiveadam.fm for resources and links and all of that stuff. And thank you for listening. Friends, I mean it. I know I say this often. I mean it every single damn time. I'm so honored that you listen to these conversations, that you show up week after week after week. This episode was produced by Chad Snavely and the team at Sound On, Sound Off Studios. Let's Give a Damn as part of the Matter Media family. You can reach out to me any time and for any reason at hello at letsgiveadam.com or text me at 646-328-6414. Sending so much love and peace to each one of you. Stay safe, keep giving a damn, and until next time, Bye for now.